Hi everybody, International Master David Proust here with your professional chess lesson for the week. Um, this game here is taken from, or this segment of a game here is taken from Grandmaster Romain Edouard, or Muggsy, um, playing for the London Lions as a free agent. And here he's playing black against game over bro of the chess bras. Um, and uh, this structure here is a structure which I've encountered many times uh, in my own chess playing days. So I think that this is a structure which um, it's useful to know a couple extra things about. And uh, should be the lessons from this should be applicable to a lot of a lot of you. So anyway, um, what white plays here is going to be first f4, defending the pawn on e5. And let's just consider the structure for a moment. I mean, what opening do you think that it came from? There's more than one that it um, commonly comes from. Of course, it could also have arisen from some trick opening, like, you know, white could have played 1h3, and somehow the players could have gotten here. But... Realistically, this is a structure most seen in the French defense and the Sicilian. Now, <clears throat> if it were a French defense, the one thing that's a little bit unusual would be the bishop on g7, because that bishop would usually be on e7 if this were a French defense. And, of course, the knight on e3 would be slightly weird too, but it's really this extra move g6 that makes this not just an absolutely standard French defense pawn structure. Um, it means that in some ways, the king's defenses are different than if he had a pawn on g7. Um, some ways maybe better having an extra piece here. Some ways worse having this um, pawn structure that you know doesn't cover any of the dark squares. And so this bishop is so important for keeping white out. Um, in some ways, the bishop could sometimes be well placed here if there's an f6 break. But more often than not, the bishop's actually worse here than in the French defense where it can come to c5 and sort of challenge squares on this diagonal. Um, so sometimes in this structure, you see this bishop, because of the strength of the e5 pawn, dropping back to f8 in order to sort of aim in both directions. Um, so uh, with all that being uh, said here, um, this pawn structure here to me seems slightly more likely to come out of a French defense with the bishop on g7. And I have most often gotten this structure myself playing against sort of like closed Sicilians or Grand Prix attack Sicilians like that. And, um, you know, it's just sometimes black will at some point challenge the white pawn on e4 if white has an e4, f4 pawn duo. And white will try and keep the position closed by playing e4, e5 in order to be able to slowly attack the black king. And if you've ever played these positions as black, you may be familiar with this sort of sensation that white's going to play g4 and f5, and he's eventually going to get this attack. And you've got quite a lot of time seeing this attack coming, but you can't necessarily find a way to defend it long term, nor can you find your counterplay in time. So you're like, what am I supposed to do against this stupid Grand Prix attack or close Sicilian kind of attack? Um, I have definitely felt that so many times in my career at, at different levels. You know, at some level you learn one thing you can do about it and you're like, ah, finally I know how to deal with this. And then you come up against better Grand Prix players or better close Sicilian players and you find that it's still not sufficient. There's more, another level to attain in this kind of position. So anyway, um, in this uh, position here, White himself has just forced this structure closed on purpose by playing e5 when the bishop attacked the queen and the d6 pawn is not uh, sufficiently defended. So black saves the d6 pawn by d5 and then white played f4. And so, yeah, so white wants to move this knight to somewhere like d4 or b4, maybe to blockade against black breaking with b4 or d4. And then he wants to slowly play like g4 and f5 and get an attack. Um... So what does black want to do? Well, with the rook on b8, naturally what black would like to play is the move b4, almost uh, certainly. That would be the main plan for black here. Um, failing that, you can sometimes look at a d4 pawn sack. Not a d4 queen sack. That's not going to be good enough, even if d4 is positionally desirable. But, you know, if we could re rearrange it with the bishop and the queen and, like, break with d4, yeah. So nothing that revolutionary just yet. I mean, we know that black wants to try and play b4, d4, and break something open on one of those sides of the board. So let's see how um, Muggsy goes about that. First, he brings his bishop to a6. 
Um, this is a very bad piece, and one of the main reasons you want to play b4, d4 is so this guy's not still just watching from c8 when white checkmates your king. Um, this move appears to maybe threaten the move b4. Why couldn't black just play b4 right away here? I mean, the rook is, is supporting it. Well, because white would play c4. And again, this queen on this diagonal means that black just gets cracked on the d5 square. White's going to take it, go ahead a pawn for nothing, leave him with the strong e5 pawn blocking out black's bishop. And although it'll open the center of the board, it'll actually be black who's playing with one less piece in the center of the board after it opens up. So it'll be a pawn plus for white. Um, it'll be really bad for black. So he plays bishop a6, looking at this rook and sort of theoretically starting to make b4 more plausible and also trying to improve that bishop. Now white reacts very logically rerouting the badly placed knight making room for the bishop to develop and looking at knight b4 and knight d4 i mean these these moves look quite good for white right they'll come with a tempo they'll blockade oddly enough this is the move which allows b4 so if you don't calculate sometimes the most obvious move like oh i'll just control b4 and stop b4 sometimes the most obvious move is the move that actually allows it in this position, it turns out black's not even threatening b4. Like if I play a random move like king h2 and black plays b4, I can still play c4 for white, um, even with my rook on this diagonal. Um, I can still play c4 supported by the knight. And I've got this good pressure on d5. There are scenarios where I could take on d5 and sack in exchange. Um, you know, or other scenarios where white could maybe play like b3 and, and defend this pawn. So... Um, yeah, I mean, c4 is still playable for white here in case of b4. But what I would do for white here, certainly, is I would deal with this bishop. And that means moving the rook. I don't want to go to f2 because knight e4 is probably going to be played at some point. So that leaves me with rook f3, which supports this pawn and lifts the rook for kingside attacks but blocks my bishop, or rook to e1 which gets off of the f5 where I want to attack, but does defend my e5 pawn for later when I try and push f5. Um, and so my inclination would be to play rook e1. I wouldn't say you're wrong if your inclination is to play something else. I would play rook e1 in this position. And then if b4, I can definitely play c4. And with my rook off this diagonal, black's just going to lose. Um, so on rook e1... Maybe black would just play a move like knight e4 or something. And now I'd be willing to play knight c2 without my rook here. Um, and yeah, tactically, I have avoided all the pitfalls prevented b4 and d4 for now. I've prevented knight takes g3 because knight b4 will win a piece. So I've got another move to, to defend this with you know, my queen or something. And I would think that white definitely has some advantage in this position here. Um, I know this video is supposed to sort of teach you how to play this kind of position for black, but I mean, if white plays this very precise move order with rook e1 and knight c2, I don't see a way for black to fully equalize. Um, he's got this slightly bad bishop. White has this slight space advantage, and this is actually something that, you know, one's going to struggle a little bit to defend against for black. I would say if this knight ever decides to outpost on one of these two squares, it gives you some hope of playing the other pawn break, um, so you want to look for that, and um, you want to continually be willing to lose a pawn on e4 if necessary, because you can then follow up with bishop b7. So like if white played, if I played like rook a8 to defend my bishop and white played queen d3, you know, in many cases you have to be willing to let white trade and win a pawn here, um, and then play bishop b7 at the end. It has to be something that that you're willing to do sometimes. Um, not that it would be like terrible to play bishop b7 in some cases as well and, and actually defend this. Um, but that's that's one thought to have that we're willing to have this trade and this bishop become good. And as long as we keep this knight here, we're restraining f5 a little bit because of the possibility of bishop takes e5. So I would kind of focus a little bit on restraining f5 by defending e5, not by trying to control f5 because white can usually play it as a sack. Um, but that would be the other thing I would go for as black here. Um, so back to the game. After black plays bishop a6 and white plays knight c2, it turns out black can play b4. And uh, Muggsy is calculating the details as well as thinking about the strategy of what he wants to do. And he notices that knight c2 
has actually completely allowed before, and he plays it. Um, so white uh, takes here with the knight. Um, if they take with the pawn, black can also just take on f1. And on pawn takes knight, play bishop takes bishop, and black's up in exchange. Um, and if bishop or queen takes, then black can save the knight. Um, they can also just play knight to b3. <laughs> um, should be a good move as well, probably right here. Hitting the rook and hitting the rook. So, um, so white took with the knight, hits the queen, so black has to sack the exchange before taking the exchange. And now in this position, um, black is basically, it's looking like black has sacked a pawn, right? They sack the B pawn, giving white the doubled B pawns, but successfully opening up this area of the board. Now they no, lo no longer have the rook on the B file to take advantage of that. And this bishop is locked out of the queen side. So I have many times done things like this with black and had it come back to haunt me. Like I'm trying to crack open logically this other side of the board before white gets the king side rolling. But then somehow white fights back on the queen side and gets a good position. And I'm going to show you like a warning scenario of how that could happen if white had played the better move. Bishop takes f1 in this position. In the game, white plays queen takes f1, which is kind of like a pretty noticeable error. So we'll see that in a second. So bishop takes f1. Um, now the knight is attacked, and it's got to choose somewhere to go. So logically, the central outpost and attacking g3. Now... In this position, um, I'm just going to, I'm not going to go into super, super long variations, but I'm just going to show you one idea um, for how this could go. Here, black could play a move like rook c8 or rook b8 would be sort of like the most simple looking kind of like obvious moves for black. Um, and my worry with positions like this as black is that basically white gets this bishop onto this diagonal with this one and um you see here an example of how this bishop's probably coming to f8 to help fight this position right but um but imagine a position like this right where white's got the bishop pair looking at the queen side um since we've opened up more than one file on the queen side the white rook got an open file just as well as ours did and uh this b pawn and he could if we didn't sack a pawn, he might not even have the b2 pawn. This same position without a b2 pawn for white is not any worse for white, really, than the position with the b2 pawn in some senses, because then there would be rook b1 to extra defend this, maybe. It depends. But certainly with or without the extra b pawn, this position could potentially be good for white, right, with the bishops supporting this, this pawn becoming strong, and the, and the rook coming out. So this is the kind of situation that that sometimes happens to me and it's like oh why did i crack open the queen side what's this all about but um let me show you one super careful move against bishop takes f1 that i think might give black an okay position we'll start with 94 and queen b3 there's a lot of other possible moves i could play but i'm just giving you one in this position i would suggest the move rook to d8 instead of rook to b8 Instead of try to, trying to fight against this pawn, which is probably coming up the board anyway at some point, I'm going to try and get active. And again, rook c8 was the other more obvious move that goes to an open file. But I'm specifically trying to trap this bishop on c1. I'm saying if it comes here, I want to have the move d4. And um, yeah, and then what I want to follow up with, if white is playing like b5 and stuff, is I'm going to try and play like my bishop or queen b6, right? But I'm going to try and get to this diagonal with my pieces. And if white plays bishop e3, I'm going to have the move d4. So um, I think with this move, black, I mean, still has, you know, fine chances, maybe like equal. Whereas when I played less precisely and let white get the b pawn rolling and the bishop developed to the e3, a7 diagonal, which seems really like the critical diagonal here, um, then I thought that that's an example of what could go wrong for black. But here... You know, by keeping this option, by staying like active with the pieces as much as possible, rerouting this bishop quickly, I think you can still fight this, you know, against this b pawn and have have a kind of balance in this position. Now, let's see what can go right for Black. Finally, now that we've seen some sort of like struggles and some how to like stay in there when things aren't going well. After Queen F1 from White, this is a major mistake. White's thinking it's important to keep the bishop on this diagonal. 
Um, and in some ways it is, and maybe white's even thinking that the queen somehow is useful taking another diagonal while the bishop controls this one. But it just gives a one critical square, which changes everything. Um, it turns everything on its head, which is knight b3, just hitting the rook and getting in and starting to control the d4 square. And uh, this is going to allow black to take over the c file, basically. This one knight to b3 move. And if we go back a second, you can see the white queen was covering that. Um, I think white may have been worried about the knight coming to e4, and that may have been one of the reasons to leave the bishop here as this like option to just trade it off. Um, because in the queen f1 line, if black plays here, we can certainly imagine, I'm not saying white would have to do it right away, but you can imagine this kind of structure here, that the black bishop would be worse than the white bishop, and the b pawn would become good, and now black doesn't have... He has this sort of like loose pass pawn instead of this protected pass pawn, so things could all go wrong for black here, potentially. Um, but after knight b3, everything's going to go right for black. Um, so first of all, the rook has to defend the bishop on c1, so rook b1 is played. And now a very nice, precise move from black. He plays queen b6, check right away. He doesn't want to develop the rook to the open file or to b8 for that matter, because if white plays bishop e3, now you can't play d4 because of this, and now you can't get the check, and suddenly we might get into that sort of losing scenario for black where white gets the bishop pair out and starts advancing this b-pawn at some point here. Um, so very precise to play queen b6 check. And now white played king to h2. If instead white had played queen f2, then they actually just lose a full piece. And we see how critical black's knight b3 was tactically. It's just trying to trap this bishop, right? d4, and that's it. End of the road, end of the diagonal. So queen b6, king h2, and now just... I mean, it's obvious, but it's also strong. The rook just comes to the open file, wants to come into c2, wants to keep an eye on c1 to keep the white pieces from moving. And white's in danger of basically getting the rook trapped here, not able to move because the bishop is trapped and can't move. And that's going to be like too many pieces trapped to really play the game. So white sees the threat as rook c2 and decides to stop it with queen to d1. Um, there's not really anything great for white to do here because they actually can't stop rook c2, not with queen d1, not with queen d3. Um, so I don't really have a great suggestion for white um, of how to defend this position, but I think the best option to sort of prolong the game a little bit would probably just be queen e1, allowing rook c2, but not allowing the move that black is going to play, which you guys can start trying to think for yourselves. I'm going to give you a chance to test yourselves for a second, but not allowing the move black is going to play um, and sort of maybe eyeing bishop e3 at some point and then tucking the bishop here if need be. So fighting for control of this, fighting for control of this. Okay, so white plays queen to d1, slightly mistaken, and what does black do here? This knight's being challenged. It's very important. Whoever sort of has to like give up a square could get into a bad situation, right? If this knight went to d4, for example, and white played bishop e3, you'd better have a very good plan of what you want to do for black because that bishop just got where it needed to go, the knight lost where it needed, everything's going to start coming out for white if you don't have something good. So what did black do here? It's a very clean, instructive move. He brings the queen to f2, ignoring the knight and just focusing on the power of rook c2. And we've reached a point where the white pieces have been trapped long enough that um, once white takes the knight and black plays rook c2, these pieces cannot get over to deal with this threat against the bishop, which is what black wanted to do anyway with rook c2 was always going to be to try and attack along the weakened second rank towards the white king. But there's no there's no defense here if queen to f3, queen takes f3, and he can't take back. So, yeah. So basically, I mean, black just won the game here. White sacked the queen to avoid the checkmate, and... Black took back here and went on to um, win pretty cleanly. It still still requires some grandmaster technique, but he had it. So you know, and and anything after this is outside the purview of our lesson. So a very instructive how Black uses this. Right, he never takes the B pawn. Um, 
he just really emphasizes getting control of that open file and getting his rook in. Um, and uh, it's enough to, to win that one. So hopefully you've learned something from the interplay of, of ideas here between white and black as the position is sort of blown open by this B4 move and seeing some of the scenarios that can be good for white or for black. And so you'll be a little bit more confident navigating these kind of options yourself in the future. All right, um, enjoy the Battle Royales this coming week seven. And uh, I'll see you again next week with another pro chess lesson, as well as highlight videos on the uh, Chesscom YouTube channel. And uh, take care, everybody.